Welcome to Transformed by Grace, an in-depth Bible study of God's Word presented by the Berean Bible Society. Join us each time on this station as Pastor Kevin brings the transforming message of God's grace revealed through the Holy Scriptures. Two friends, Bill and Tom, were up late discussing the difference between irritation, anger, and rage. At about midnight, Bill said, look, Tom, I'll show you an example of irritation. He took his phone and dialed a number at random. The phone rang and rang and rang. Finally, when a sleepy voice at the other end answered, Bill said, I'd like to speak to Jones. There's no one here named Jones, the disgruntled man replied as he hung up. That, Bill said to Tom, is a man who is irritated. An hour later at 1 a.m., Bill said, now I'll show you a man who is angry. Took his phone, dialed the same number, and let it ring. Eventually, the same sleepy voice answered the phone. Bill asked, May I please speak with Jones? There's no one here named Jones, came the angry reply, this time louder, and the man hung up. An hour later at 2 a.m., Bill said, Now I'll show you an example of rage. He took his phone, dialed the same number, let it ring. When the sleepy man finally answered, Bill said, Hi, this is Jones. Have there been any calls for me? Speaking of getting calls, Abraham was called to leave his home and his family, and he answered this call without any irritation, anger, or rage, but instead with faith. Genesis 12, verse 1 reads, Now the Lord had said unto Abram, Get thee out of thy country, and from thy kindred, and from thy father's house, unto a land that I will show thee. The term watershed means a crucial dividing point, line, or factor, a turning point. We have a watershed moment in Genesis chapter 12. It is a crucial dividing line in how God dealt with mankind. There is great dispensational significance here with the beginning of of the dispensation of promise. So as we look at major events of the Bible in this series, it's very important for us to look at the call of Abraham. In the first 11 chapters of Genesis, God had been dealing with the whole earth. You see that by the accounts of the creation, the family and generations of Adam, the flood in Noah's day and the Tower of Babel. These 11 chapters clearly demonstrate that after sin entered the world, the whole earth spiraled downward and was bent toward corruption, wickedness, and destruction. Starting in Genesis 12, however, God launches a brilliant plan to provide salvation for mankind. With this passage, the focus of Genesis narrows from the wider history of the human race to that of one family. And the story of that one family, Israel, continues in and through much of the rest of your Bible. Abraham is the founder of that one family, the nation of Israel. When God saw the wickedness of man in the days of Noah, and he determined to bring the worldwide flood, God chose one faithful man to reestablish his plan with mankind. After the Tower of Babel and the judgment of God and confusing man's language and dispersing man all over the world, God then chose one man, Abraham, to create a new nation to reach all the other nations of the world. In the closing verses of Genesis 11, we learn the following. And Terah took Abram, his son, and Lot, the son of Haran, his son's son, and Sarai, his daughter-in-law, his son Abram's wife, and they went forth with them from Ur of the Chaldees to go into the land of Canaan, and they came unto Haran and dwelt there. Abraham had been living in the city of Ur in the land of the Chaldees with his father Terah, his wife Sarah, and his nephew Lot. Ur of the Chaldeans was in southern Mesopotamia. It was a significant and prosperous city in that day, situated on the banks of the Euphrates River, close to the Persian Gulf, and near Basra in modern-day Iraq. 
Ur was also a center of pagan idolatry, and God called Abram out of this pagan world and its idolatry. In the book of Joshua, we read this, And Joshua said unto all the people, Thus saith the Lord God of Israel, Your fathers dwelt on the other side of the flood, or the river Euphrates, in old time, even Terah, the father of Abraham, and the father of Nacor, and they served other gods. Abraham's father, Terah, was not a believer. He did not bring up his son, Abram, to believe in the one true God. Instead, Joshua reminded Israel that their forefathers came from Ur on the Euphrates, where Abraham's father and family worshipped pagan gods. The reason Abraham, with his family, had left the city of Ur in the land of Chaldees was because of Genesis 12, 1, which says, Now the Lord had said unto Abram, Get thee out of thy country. As you read Genesis 12, 1, the context of a couple verses earlier teaches that Abraham and his family had already left Ur and were in Haran, Haran at that time. But in, with the past tense had here, means that Genesis 12, 1 is a flashback to when Abram was living in Ur of the Chaldees. There God had appeared to Abraham and spoke to him. We know this by Stephen's discourse in Acts 7 also about Israel's history where Stephen said, The God of glory appeared unto our father Abraham when he was in Mesopotamia, before he dwelt in Quran or Haran, and said unto him, Get thee out of thy country and from thy kindred, and come into the land which I will show thee. Abraham's life changed forever when the God of glory unexpectedly appeared to him and spoke to him in Ur. When God appeared to Abraham, God called him to leave his country, his kindred, and his father's household. There are three levels of increasing demands on Abraham's life in this. It goes from broad to narrow and to narrower. The country uh, was the region of his dwelling. The kindred were his relatives, his kinfolk and broader family. And his father's house was his immediate family and home. God called Abraham to leave his homeland and to move to a different country, unto a land that I will show thee. God told Abraham to leave Ur, and at first... God didn't tell him where he was going. He gave him no map, no directions, and no location. Hebrews 11.8 says, By faith Abraham, when he was called to go out into a place, he went out not knowing whither he went. God was requiring faith from Abraham and desired that he uproot his whole life and just follow his leading by faith and God would later show him the place he was to go. With this call, it's been said well that Abraham was being asked to forsake everything in order to follow God's call. What would you do? You're in the prime of life. You've got a good job, a nice nest egg, a home you like, friends you admire, neighbors who respect you. You're upstanding, you're an upstanding, a valuable part of the community. You've got a good future ahead of you. The last thing you want to do is move. And now God, whom you've just met, wants you to leave everything, your family, your friends, your country, your home, your business, your security. What would you do? Is God calling you to the ministry to be a pastor? Maybe he's calling you to the mission field. Or is he calling you to go to Bible school? Or to serve as a teacher at your local church? Or to form and lead a Bible study? Or to become an elder or deacon in your church? If your first thought is, I can't, or I'm not qualified, that's a great first step. Because then you have to rely on the Lord to go forward. Like Abraham could have done, there were legitimate objections to raise and real obstacles to overcome when God called. But Abraham looked beyond those things, and he just responded to God's call and went forward by faith. And as a result, he was blessed, and 
he became a blessing to others, just like we can in life when we give our lives to the Lord to follow and to serve him. Genesis 12, 2 and 3 read, And I will make of thee a great nation, and I will bless thee, and make thy name great, and thou shalt be a blessing. And I will bless them that bless thee, and curse him that curseth thee, and in thee shall all families of the earth be blessed. God made three promises of blessing to Abraham when he called him to leave Ur. First, I will make of thee a great nation. Second, I will make thy name great. And third, I will bless them that bless thee and curse them that curse thee. And in thee shall all families of the earth be blessed. We'll be returning to the program in just a minute. But first, we'd like to take this time to thank you, our partners, for making these programs possible. If you would like to access our library of helpful Bible study tools, go to BereanBibleSociety.org. More Rightly Divided Answers to Frequently Asked Questions is a 296-page paperback book written by Pastor Ricky Kurth. The author's first FAQ book, Rightly Divided Answers to Frequently Asked Questions, was so well received that we felt constrained to publish a sequel. In this present volume, we pick up the sword of God's rightly divided word again and bring it to bear on some questions that all Christians ask. Questions and answers in this book cover the following topics. Sin and suffering, salvation, eternal security, the grace message, and the Christian life. To order your copy, contact Berean Bible Society for pricing and availability at 262-255-4750 or visit our website at BereanBibleSociety.org. To receive our free full-color 32-page monthly magazine, The Berean Searchlight, call 262-255-4750 or subscribe online at www.bereanbiblesociety.org. Thank you again for your generous gifts. Now, Genesis 11, verse 30 states that in Ur, before they left the city, Sarah was barren. She had no child. Abraham was childless. And when God appeared to Abraham in Ur, Abraham knew his wife was barren. And yet God promised he would make Abram a father of many nations. It took faith for Abraham to believe that God would make a great nation from him, that he would have children and grandchildren, and that his multiplied seed would become a great nation. That great nation that came from him was the nation of Israel. God also promised to make his name great. The promise of a great name in this context reminds us of the Tower of Babel and how they said, and let us make us a name. The connection shows us that the relationship between the call of Abraham in chapter 12 and the Tower of Babel in chapter 11 should be noted and compared. Babel is about the plans of man and them repeatedly saying, let us, let us. The call of Abraham is about the plans of God and God repeatedly saying, I will, I will. At Babel, men chose to disregard the command of God to replenish and fill the earth. They strove to find security and renown by banding together and building a great city. They sought blessing as a result of their own labors rather than by faith in God's promise. And so God judged and scattered them. Whereas Abraham was secure and comfortable in a great city in Ur, but God called him to leave that city, to follow his leading by faith, and to live as a pilgrim in a strange land. And when Abraham did that by faith, God blessed him. The people at Babel wanted to make a name for themselves, and they failed. God promised Abraham a great name as a result of leaving the city of Ur, leaving the security of his family and home, and trusting God. And when Abraham did that, God did for Abraham what those at Babel tried so selfishly to do themselves. 
and God made the name of Abraham great. God also promised protection for Abraham, saying that he would bless those that bless Abraham and curse those that curse him. The promise was made specifically to Abraham, but it also applied in the broader sense to his descendants, the Jewish nation. And we see examples of that in scripture, such as when Potiphar's house and all of Egypt was blessed because of Joseph. And then later, how Egypt was cursed because of them cursing the children of Israel in their bondage. Not only was Abraham promised personal blessing, but God also promised to make him a blessing, even to the point where all the families of the earth would be blessed in Abraham and through his seed. In Genesis 18:18, 18, 18, the Lord also said, Abraham shall surely become a great and mighty nation and all the nations of the earth shall be blessed in him. Genesis 12, 2 to 3 is God's stated purpose for the nation of Israel, for Israel to be a blessing to all the families of the earth. This was God's plan all the way through early Acts, and it will pick up again after the rapture of the church. That one nation would be a light to all the other nations, one family to be a blessing to all the other families of the earth. This was for the purpose of the perpetuation and preservation of God's truth and for reaching and leading the nations to the one true God and to the proper worship of him. The call of Abraham helps us to understand our Bibles when we understand this plan of God and this stated purpose for the nation of Israel. Moses ministered under this plan, and the law that was given to Israel at that time was that she might be a blessing to the nations by being a kingdom of priests and a holy nation who lived and ministered according to God's standard of righteousness in the law. The kings of Israel ministered under this plan. The glory of Israel on the days of David and Solomon made Israel God's intended blessing to the families of the earth. All the prophets ministered under this plan. God sent the prophets to Israel to call her back to God, back to his law, that through faith and obedience she might be blessed by God and be that blessing to the nations. The Lord Jesus Christ ministered in his earthly ministry according to this plan to make Israel a blessing, to make her a light for the nations. That's why he taught his disciples that he was not sent, but unto the lost sheep of the house of Israel. And he told Israel that ye are the light of the world. After Christ's ascension, Peter and the apostles ministered according to this plan. After healing the lame man, Peter preached to those in Jerusalem and told them, ye are the children of the prophets and of the covenant which God made with our fathers saying unto Abraham, and in thy seed shall all the kindreds of the earth be blessed. Unto you first, God, having raised up his son Jesus, sent him to bless you in turning away every one of you from his iniquities. And after the rapture of the church, this will be the plan for the tribulation period and the millennial kingdom for Israel to be a blessing that she might lead the nations to Jesus Christ, the true God, to find salvation and life in His name and to worship Him alone. But Israel fell in her unbelief of Jesus Christ. And God has temporarily set Israel aside until after the rapture. So Genesis 12, 2-3 is not God's plan today. Instead, God's plan is for the church, the body of Christ, made up of individual believing Gentiles and Jews, to be his light and his ambassadors for Christ. We, the church, have been given the ministry of reconciliation, and we are called by God to go out to the world with the gospel of grace 
and to make known the good news that Christ died for our sins and rose again and that we are saved from all of our sins by faith alone in Christ. Genesis 12, 4 to 8 reads, So Abram departed as the Lord had spoken unto him, and Lot went with him. And Abram was seventy and five years old when he departed out of Haran. And Abram took Sarai, his wife, and Lot, his brother's son, and all their substance that they had gathered, and the souls that they had gotten in Haran. And they went forth to go into the land of Canaan, and into the land of Canaan they came. And Abram passed through the land unto the place of Sichem, under the plain of Morah, and the Canaanite was then in the land. And the Lord appeared unto Abram and said, Unto thy seed will I give this land. And there builded he an altar unto the Lord who appeared unto him. And he removed from thence into a mountain on the east of Bethel, and pitched his tent, having Bethel on the west and Hai on the east. And there he built an altar unto the Lord and called upon the name of the Lord. God called and Abraham obeyed by faith. After God appeared to Abraham and Ur with his family, he left his city, home, familiar surroundings, family and friends, and went out by faith to an unknown destination and future. He left Ur because he fully believed the promises that God had made to him. And fully believing the promises of God can move us as well in life to respond to the Lord and to obey and live out his word and for the eternal. Abraham and his family traveled out of Ur in Mesopotamia, over 600 miles northwest to Haran. However, the patriarch of the family, Terah, Abraham's father, stopped short of Canaan, settling down and dwelling in Haran. Haran was another prosperous city, which was located on an an important trade route in what is modern-day northern Syria. And it was a city like Ur that was known for its idol worship. So it's not surprising that Terah decided to dwell there. Abraham and his family stayed in Haran for a time until his father Terah died. After Terah's death, Abraham immediately acted in faith and he was out of there like a shot to continue the journey to the land as God had instructed him. As Acts 7, 4 puts it, Then came he out of the land of the Chaldeans and dwelt in Quran or Haran. And from thence, when his father was dead, he removed him into this land. Abraham departed Haran with his wife Sarah and his nephew Lot. They with their servants all then set out for Canaan, which was another long journey of around 400 to 500 miles to the southwest. As Abraham entered Canaan, he stopped for a time at Shechem, near the center of the land. Here the Lord appeared unto Abram, and this was a Christophany, or a pre-incarnate appearance of the Lord Jesus Christ. And the Lord blessed him and told him at this appearance, Unto thy seed will I give this land. Abraham was now 75 years old, his wife was still barren, and they were still childless, yet God told him that his seed would be given this land. Again, this took faith by Abraham to believe this promise. Verse 6 states that the Canaanite was then in the land, or they were the present possessors of the land, but the Lord appeared to Abraham to promise and assure him that this land belong not to the Canaanites, but to Abraham and his posterity. His promise to Abraham was a, of a future possession of the land through descendants to come. Acts 7 reminds us that Abraham was not personally given any of the land, and he, or God, gave him, or Abraham, none inheritance in it. No, not so much as to set his foot on. Yet he promised that he would give it to him for a possession and to his seed after him, when as yet he had no child. Abraham was promised both a great nation and the land for his seed, but he had no outward proof of either. He could only trust God for the fulfillment of these things. Also, Abraham was called to this unknown land, but he was not told until after he arrived there 
that his seed would be given that land. It wasn't the promise that his descendants would inherit the land that brought him all the way to Canaan, but just his faith in God. And then after he arrived in the land, then God blessed him because of his faith and promised the land to his seed, the land that we call the promised land. It's important to remember, too, that Moses wrote the book of Genesis. And those who first read this book, the children of Israel in Moses' day, they were about to take possession of the land, which was promised to Abraham's seed. The account of strong faith by their father Abraham would have been a strong and great encouragement for them to act in faith, to go forward and take possession of that land as God promised. After the Lord's appearance uh, and promise to him, Abraham built an altar to the Lord. Then Abraham continued traveling further south into Canaan, 20 miles. He came to Bethel, which is about seven miles north of where Jerusalem would later be. There he pitched his tent and he built another altar to the Lord. But the altar and the tent the, that he pitched symbolize two features of Abraham's character and faith. The altar shows that he was a worshiper of the true God and the tent that he was a pilgrim and a stranger in this world. He had nothing on earth, but he had his all in God. When he met him, Abraham was in Ur in the middle of all this idol worship. As we leave Abraham, we find him worshiping the true God in Canaan. God called, he obeyed, stepped out on faith. When he arrived, he worshiped God. Abraham is a powerful and great example, if not the greatest example, of a man of faith within Scripture. And he challenges us to grow in our faith. And it's been said well that if you ever carve the Mount Rushmore of faith, you would have to start with Abraham. Thank you again for tuning in to Transformed by Grace. We appreciate your prayer support and the financial gifts. The purpose and mission of the Berean Bible Society is to help you understand the whole counsel of the Word of God. For more information, visit our website at www.bereanbiblesociety.org or give us a call at 262-255-4750. Or if you prefer, write us at the Berean Bible Society. P.O. Box 756, Germantown, Wisconsin, 53022. Now until next time, may you be transformed by God's grace.